So the wife, being the chief operating officer of the Smith Family Enterprise, has made an executive decision, for some reason, to swap our bedroom and the toy room. Because this room is bigger. So this was our bedroom, and now this much smaller room is our bedroom. Ladies, you ever just have that urge to, you know, just change the house randomly? Because it seems to happen every, you know, three to six months. This is not just an urge. This is backed by by thinking through what we want for our toy room over the next five years that we live in this house. And this room will facilitate that. That room wouldn't. Besides the fact, all we do is sleep in it. So let's have the smallest room to waste the least amount of space. You also have good reasons for randomly changing the house. So speaking of random urges, I gotta get out of the house and I haven't been on my bike since it started getting cold. So I'm gonna go on a quick ride. Oh man, I can't tell you how glad I am that my urges don't involve me rearranging the house. <laughs> All I have to do is get out of the bike for a while. <laughs> what a beautiful day it is today. It's like almost 70 degrees in Texas, and it's uh, New Year's Eve. It's a great place to live. So the thing about urges and being married is that if your partner gets an urge, it somehow affects you too. It's because you love me. Okay, I gotta get some more work done in my office. I think the rule has to be that if it's in this room, it's gotta be something that I use frequently or it has to be out of this room. Either in the trash, I gotta sell it, or store it somewhere else. Because there's too much stuff in here that I don't use regularly and this has to be, you know, an effective, efficient workspace. So, here we go. <laughs> I want you to look at these uh, canine sluts that live in my house. They just basically get to sit around all day and lay on comfy things, make messes, and then go back to laying down. All right, so here's the plan. New computer, built a few weeks ago. Never really finished it, I haven't put the back on. I gotta add, I gotta finish adding my hard drives. Uh, the liquid cool system's been running for a few weeks, and I guess as the air has worked its way out of the system, the level has gone down uh, below where I want it. So we're gonna add some liquid, and uh, maybe install one of the hard drives uh, into the back. All right, so here's the deal. The fill port's right here. And uh, basically I've got this um, little piece of tubing that I left attached with a, with a mount point that I can use to basically attach to the fill port uh, and sort of act like a funnel to help me add liquid. Bad news is I've never once successfully done this without making a gigantic mess. I should probably turn the computer off too, but where would be the fun in that? Okay. See, I've already got red stuff on me. And this stuff stains. It's, I guess it's got so much coloring in it that whatever it touches, like my hands are gonna look bloody for like three days. All right, so we screw this in. My, my lack of patience to do this right is probably why it's always messy. Doing this on camera is not making it any easier. Okay, there we go. Oh God, see, we're dripping. Why are we dripping? That's probably enough. <sighs> well, I got some on my phone. Why was my phone under where you were pouring liquid, you might ask? I don't know. Oh man, look at that. It's so bright. So why do I have this really complicated liquid cooling system on my computer? Well, let me show you the rotting carcass of my last computer. See this guy back here? Yeah, he's dead. He's no longer alive. Um, basically, I didn't build in adequate cooling on him when I built him. And so over time, I basically melted the processor. It would basically overheat and turn off. And rather than take that as a sign I needed to do something about it because I was busy on whatever project I was doing at the time, I would just give it a few minutes and turn it back on and continue with what I was doing. And so enough of that happening over a long period of time and it just basically stopped turning on. So built a new machine. This time I wanted to sort of slay that monster completely. So I, <laughs> I overkilled it. We've got the reservoir here. 
uh, with a splitter down at the bottom. And on the left, it just kind of goes down to a drain. That's for if I ever need to empty it for whatever reason. Then to the right, it comes out here, goes up and into this radiator large enough to probably cool a motorcycle. In fact, I know it would cool a motorcycle because on my old bike, it had a radiator that was smaller than this one. Then out of here, we go into the motherboard. This was the first motherboard I've ever had that had liquid cooling built in to cool some of the components that handle overclocking things that they get hot too. Uh, so then it comes out of the motherboard into the processor, nothing fancy there out into the Ram. This was another one. So if I'm going to be overclocking the Ram, it's going to get too hot. This is a cooling block for the Ram out there and back into the reservoir. So that's basically it. I wanted to win that fight before it began on the new machine. I never, like I can run this thing flat out for days and the, the temperature on the components barely move more than a, a few degrees C. So next on this project, I'll probably be putting the hard drives from the old computer into it and then locking up the back. It comes with a big piece of clear plexi to put on the front of it to kind of make it look like a showpiece. It's even meant to hang on the wall. I don't think I'm gonna hang it on the wall. I don't know, maybe it will. Anyway, that's that project. We will pick it up another day. All right, I changed my mind. So the whole point of this blog was to not just cover like puppies and, and happy thoughts all day, right? But to actually make some real conversation, there's just like a real pressure to, you know, keep it happy and fun. So I'm starting to understand that like, you know, I gotta be real with y'all every once in a while or there's no point in me doing this, right? So what happened was I got this in the mail this is a red light ticket from one of the cities nearby. And I was like, oh, I, I, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to talk about it. No one's going to care. People get these all the time and they, you know, they have to go pay their fine and it's over. They don't want to hear me talk about it. But that's the whole point is to, is to talk about like what's happening in the world and if it's right or wrong. This is wrong. Red light tickets are wrong. They're unethical. They're immoral. Why? It's called a victimless crime, which means it's a crime that really isn't a crime because there is no victim. No victim means that there's no person or company or property owner who is damaged by whatever it is the law says is illegal, whatever the crime is being created for. A red light ticket is the perfect, it's like the picturesque example of a victimless crime. Not a single person was harmed in the making of this crime. That means that there is no crime. That means that for the government to come after me and take money, to steal money from me, because I didn't damage anyone, I didn't hurt anyone, there is no crime here, it's victimless, is immoral. Now people say, oh, well, you need these laws for safety. We gotta keep people safe. Society needs laws to keep us safe. If we let people run red lights, then you know, eventually somebody's going to run a red light and hit and kill somebody or, hit, you know, get into an accident and, and actually do damage. Well, I say in those circumstances, the laws are not immoral when there's actually a victim. If someone runs a red light and hits a car or hits a person or a dog or a, you know, whatever they hit, then there's a victim. Then there's a crime. Then you can start getting in, in, into this realm where you, you go after the person that caused the damages. Then you actually have damages. Then it's not just like, oh, we're gonna take $100 from you because uh, it's a crime. No, we're actually going to take the cost of whatever you damaged from you. So if you hit my car and it's $5,000 in damage, that's the fine. It's not a fine, you're paying a restitution. You're fixing what you broke. That's a real crime. That's the ethical way to handle this. This is just, this is theft. This is people in the world thinking that they have the right to control others through the force of government, through the, through the rule of law, through the rule of law. This is, this is the perfect example of something that's pervasive in our society that we need to get rid of. So yes, it's something small and mundane and it probably happens to all of you every day, or not every day, hopefully not every day, but it happens to all of us. And I was gonna, I tore it up and I was gonna throw it away and, and kind of brush it under the rug and move on. But that's the, the whole point of this conversation is to actually talk about this stuff. So there it is. Well, that's it for 2016. I hope you had a great year. For me, 2016 was all about people. I learned a lot of 
people lessons. In 2016, I met some of the best people in terms of quality that I've ever met in my entire life. Some of the people I met in 2016 raised the bar for my expectations of friends. Some of the people I've met in 2016, I hope are with me for years and years and years to come. The lesson I got from 2016 was about managing orbits. And what I mean by that is we all have orbits. <laughs> Can't use the word in the definition of the word. Think of you as a planet and your friends and acquaintances and people that you have in your life orbit around you. And they orbit around you at different distances. You have your closest friends and family, and then you have, you know, maybe the people you work with, your business associates, the people you do business with, uh, you know, your, your acquaintances way out on the outside, and then you have, like, the rest of the universe of just random people that you, you probably never come in contact with. 2016 taught me the importance of sort of mindfully managing your orbits. Who is where, if at all, in your solar system? so to speak. Good people are so rare in this world. They're like unicorns. And we have to gather them as close as we can into our inner orbits and do everything we can to hold them there. And bad people are like poison or a tumor. And we have to get them as far away from us as we possibly can. Push them as far out into the universe, away from anything that can affect us as we possibly can. When we have Bad people in our orbits, they can damage us. They can damage our property. They can damage our heart. They can damage our other relationships. So what I mean by mindfully managing our orbits and pushing bad people out is simply that. Not just go along, get along. Not just, I think most people just let people come and go for, out of their life. Sort of what happens, happens. But what I mean is if someone shows you that they're a bad person through action or word, you need to take the risk of hurting some feelings or causing some controversy or making some waves to get the bad people out of your orbit. And the same goes for good people. We need to put in the effort actively, consciously, once we've located these unicorns, to bring them in, to form stronger connections with them over time. That's the lesson of 2016 for me. Going forward, I want to, with more purpose and forethought, decide who's in my orbit, where they are, how close they are, and if they should be there at all. And if they're good people, I want to keep them close to me. Because when we have good people close to us, we gain strength, we gain confidence, we gain a momentum in life. I see a lot of exciting, really cool, really fun stuff on the horizon, and I look forward to sharing it with you guys. Happy New Year. Really? And then what happened? We got kids. Wow, that's amazing. Did you like that? Yeah. Really?